Good morning, Corinthians. So good to see you today. Please join us as we sing 148, He Keeps Me Singing. Stand as we sing, please. First, third, and fifth. First, third, and fifth. There's within my heart a everybody out this morning on beautiful Sunday morning. Several announcements and I'll try to get through all of them. If I don't, somebody raise your hand and just let me know that we've missed something. Sunday, July the 18th, there will be a baby dedication. Uh, you can see that in the insert. Uh, need to have all your information in by July the 1st uh, to Megan Blair. Uh, also, you're invited to a wedding shower for Ashton Moody and Marrying Manning this afternoon at 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then on the back of that, there is an invitation to a wedding uh, for Ms. Taylor White and Mr. Shane Brown uh, here on the 29th of May uh, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, also, uh, Vacation Bible School is going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, we're going to do a one-day event, not a whole week. Uh, it will be on June the 26th. We are needing volunteers, as many folks that can volunteer uh, we would love to have you. There is volunteer sheets out in the foyer by Miss Linda's office and then also uh, in the church, children's wing. There's also t-shirt order forms. If you would like a t-shirt, the design is on the t-shirt. Uh, if you would like one of those, there's a deadline uh, for June the 9th. We have to have all orders uh, as far as sizes, how many, and then money by June the 9th if you want a t-shirt. Um, anything else as far as announcement-wise? Uh, before we go any further, though, I would like to say uh, pray for Tyler Flint. Uh, Tyler is a young man that's been involved in the youth group here. Uh, I believe he's had appendicitis uh, this morning. He's in, actually in a Baptist hospital. So y'all pray for Tyler uh, this morning. I know there's other prayer requests, uh, especially like our pastor search committee. Pray for them uh, as well as they continue to do what uh, the Lord is leading them to do. Anybody else that we might can pray for or lift up during this time? Ms. Juanita Austin, Ms. Carol Walker, Mr. Fred King, Mr. Fred's in McGee General, and Ms. Ms. Carol and Ms. Juanita are in Baptist, so if you would pray for those as well. Anybody else? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much and just thankful for the opportunity to gather in your house. And Father God, I pray that you are high and lifted up uh, this morning, Father God, that uh, you just draw all people to yourself, Father God. And then for the requests that have been mentioned as far as prayer, Father God, we pray that you put your hand upon each one of them uh, and that you heal and that you bring about whatever needs to be done in their lives, Father God. Just pray uh, during this worship service, Holy Spirit, you move. You move in a mighty and powerful way. Uh, 
and I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our lesson today was a lot about recognizing the deity of Christ and how great thou art. Page 6. Would you please turn to page 6 and let's sing the first and last stanzas of How Great Thou Art. And we ask you to stand as we sing this little chorus. And ushers, would you come? We're going to sing it through twice. On the second time, we ask the ushers to come forth. Page 16, I worship you all, thank you, God. Sing it twice. I worship you.
Amen. Thank you. Be seated. of God.
Thank you, choir. Uh, great song, great song. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> uh, on June the 30th, 1859, one of the, considered by many to be one of the greatest tightrope walkers in history, Charles Blunden uh, became the first man to successfully walk across uh, the Niagara Falls, and approximately 25,000 people gathered that day in order to watch him walk across a thousand foot line suspended above uh, the raging falls and there were no safety nets uh, nowhere to be seen and he started on the American side walked to the Canadian side and then when he reached that side you know the crowd erupted in cheers and applause and all that kind of good stuff well he was gonna walk back across and when he was gonna walk back across he took this wheelbarrow and put it up on the tightrope and before he started back across he looked at the crowd and he said hey he said, do y'all believe that I can walk across this tightrope pushing this wheelbarrow? And everybody's like, yeah, we believe, we believe. And he turned to this reporter that happened to be covering the event, and he looked straight in that reporter's eyes, and he said, hey, do you believe that I can walk across this tightrope? The reporter's like, yeah, yeah, I, I believe, I can believe, I believe, man, I believe it. And without missing a bleat, a, a, a moment, Blondin paused, and he said, well, if you believe, he said, get in the wheelbarrow. Now, we ultimately know that dude didn't get up in that wheelbarrow because <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to believe that much. But when it comes to living for Jesus, when it comes to worshiping Jesus, when it comes to serving Jesus, when it comes to giving to Jesus, when it comes to witnessing for Jesus, we have to have this all-in mentality. We have to have this mentality where we're completely and totally sold out to Jesus. We can't hold anything back when it comes to living or following or serving or worshiping Jesus because if we hold something back, are we truly following Jesus? If there's moments of our life that we're holding back, are we truly following him? Because Jesus himself said, you can't serve two masters. He said, you're only going to love the one and hate the other. You're going to be devoted to one or despise the other. And when you get to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that is the idea that Paul is presenting here, this sort of all-in concept. And we'll start at verse 1, read through verse 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your word and, and the instruction and the insight it gives, Father God. And my prayer is more than anything that you are high and lifted up today, Father God, and that you draw all men to yourself. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Anytime in Scripture you see a therefore, you always have to stop and ask the question, what is the therefore therefore? And in and, and this particular instance, what the therefore is going to do is it's going to connect what's being said with what's been said previously. That's what Paul is basing this plea on in Romans chapter 12. He's basing it on everything that has been laid out in the previous 11 chapters because Paul makes it clear in the first couple of chapters that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. He makes that perfectly clear and that the wages of sin is death. He also goes on to say in Romans chapter 5 that there's freedom in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He also tells us in Romans chapter 8 that there is, no, uh, there is now no more condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. And it's because of what Jesus done is the reason why Paul is laying out this, this plea or this urging or this begging for people to present themselves as a living sacrifice. But Paul also says that is it is our spiritual act or service of worship. And here's the thing, and, and this is I'm pointing the finger at me too. I don't believe most people come into a worship service prepared to give their whole selves to God. When people walk in these doors, they bring their sins that need to be confessed and cleansed. They bring questions that need answers. They bring problems that need to have solutions. They bring burdens They bring lift, uh, that need to be lifted up. They bring anxieties that need to be dispelled. They bring frustrations. They bring depressions. They bring boredom. They bring preoccupations. People bring all kind of distractions in these doors. And what happens about 99% of the time we leave without ever doing anything about them? 
I believe it would be easier for most people to take out their checkbook, double their donation of what they're going to give to the offering, then offer themselves completely over to God. I believe most people have this thing of, I'm going to go to church and that's enough, but that's not enough. Here's the one thing we have not truly worshipped until we have turned ourselves completely over to God. See, worship is the outward reaction to what God has done inwardly. It's knowing that God has taken and done something in us so incredible that we want everybody to see what he's done. We want that people to know about what he's done. It's Worship is the total commitment of the total person for the total life. And here's the thing. Anything less than that, is it genuine worship? Is it true worship? See, when we truly encounter a holy God, one who came to this earth and lived a sinless life, went to a cross and died upon it to pay for our mistakes, when we truly encounter him, real worship is going to happen. There, there, there is no option. There is no choice. Real worship is going to take place when we encounter God. Real worship is not merely the offering of elaborate prayers. It's not splendid rituals or making large donations or singing majestic songs or listening to a sermon. All those things are great, but that's not real worship. Real worship happens when we confess our sin, when we turn from that sin and we say, God, I am completely and totally yours. You do whatever you want to in my life so you can be high and lifted up and people can see that and they can run to you because they want the same exact thing. And Paul said, the reason being, why do we offer ourselves God? Why do we do this? And Paul says, the first thing, it's because of his mercies. And in this passage, Paul presents God's mercies as the strongest argument possible for us of giving ourselves wholly and fully to God. I mean, he says, I urge you. And that's the, that's the strongest prompting possible. It's like almost a begging or a pleading type. I urge you, brothers. And you can almost hear the sense of urgency in his voice. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because of the mercies of God. It's because of what God has done through, uh, for us through his son, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that should be the only response. The only response should be, God, I want to give my life completely to you. I don't want to hold anything back because you didn't hold anything back when it came to giving me life. See, Jesus is the only one who extends grace greater than all of our sins. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. I can't tell you the number of people I've heard that say, I've got to clean up before I come. No, you don't. You need to come on to church and let Jesus do the cleaning. That's what you need to do. He's the only one that can bring the dead back to life, whether it be physically or spiritually. He's the only one that can save us. I love what Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says. There is no other name under heaven which men must be saved by that being Jesus Christ. See, Paul makes it clear, Romans 3, 23, that everybody's a sinner. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that, it has deathly consequences. But I love Romans 5, 8, and I'm beginning to love it more and more every time I read it. It says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were at our worst, while you were at your worst, See, he didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. He didn't wait for you to look good. He didn't wait for you to dress in your Sunday best. He said, I'm going to pursue you while you're at your worst. He pursued you. And here's the thing. He's still pursuing us today. He's still chasing after each and every one of us today. He's still coming after us. And it should be the motivating factor for each of us to give our whole selves to God. If reflecting on God's mercies doesn't move us, then we're in trouble. I had a guy ask me one time, he's like, what is it going to take to get people in church? And I said, brother, if Jesus dying on a cross ain't enough to get people in church, we're not going to get people in church. Because there's nothing we can do on our own. It's only through the mercies of God that we're able to get people in church. Here's the thing. Think about this. Where would we be without God's love and forgiveness? Where would we be without God's presence in our lives? What kind of hope would we have without him? And here's the thing, if we truly stop and think about our situation, and I'm, I know my situation is, is not the best, do we truly deserve what we have on merit alone? And I think the answer is no. See, 
We offer our lives because of the mercies of God. We say, God, I want to present to you everything that I am because of the mercy. And that should be more than enough. It's not the fact that God wants to bless us. And those are all well and good. His blessings are great. But it's the simple fact that God did something for us that nobody else could do. And that's the reason why we want to present our lives as a living sacrifice, which leads to my second point. We're to offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. That's the next thing Paul says. Paul said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. The expression living sacrifice is basically referencing back to Old Testament sacrifices. It's the Old Testament worshiper would go and he would offer these sacrifices uh, in worship. And now when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament worshiper is offering what? He's offering him or herself. That's what he's offering. That's what she's offering. And, and, and the reason we do this is because of what God has done. It's because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross that we're in return to give our lives. And here's the thing, not begrudgingly, not because we think it's got to be out of obligation or not because we have to do some kind of checklist on a Sunday morning to make everybody know we've been in the house of God, but we do it out of an attitude of celebration. We do it out of an attitude of worship. We do it out of an attitude of just being in awe of who God is and what he has done for us. Think about what has he rescued us from? Rescued us from death. He rescued us from sin. He rescued us from a place called hell. He rescued us from that, and we ought to every day just stand in awe of who he is. When's the last time you stood in awe of who God is? When's the last time you just stopped and said, God, I, let me just stop and just worship just because of who you are and what you've done? It's something that we should never get over. It's something that should always cause us to be just in an attitude of, God, what can I do next? What can I do next to, to point somebody to you or just to lift up the name of Jesus? It's something, I was talking to, to Brother Calvin just the other day, and we were talking about how churches have just watered down. The gospel should never be watered down. The gospel should be something that is on our tongue at a moment's notice, ready to share, because Jesus has done something that we, that we can't even begin to describe. So we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. When Paul uses the term body, he's implying the whole person or the physical beings by, whereby somebody the, or the person is expressed. It, this idea can basically be illustrated by a general who's surrendering. If a general comes out and he begins to wave the white flag or his sword, he's basically saying, I surrender my whole being. It's not he's surrendering partial of himself or part of himself. He's surrendering every thing that he has. And when Paul says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, even though it kind of sounds like a oxymoron, it's truthfully, and if we stop and tell ourselves truthfully, trying to present, uh, to give or present a living sacrifice is going to be harder than giving a dead one. Because a living sacrifice still means something. A living sacrifice still has value because a living sacrifice still has its life there. See, dead sacrifices have no value because life's not in them anymore. But see, a living sacrifice is going to cost us something. And I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Following Jesus is going to cost you something. And when you say, I'm going to present my bodies as a, a living sacrifice, then you're saying, Jesus, I'm willing to pray, pay whatever price it is to follow you. And there's two instances in Scripture uh, of, of living sacrifice. The first is Isaiah. I mean, yeah, Isaac. And, and we all know about Isaac's story. He was the promise of, of the covenant between uh, Abraham and God on him being a father of many nations. But think about Isaac's situation. He willingly, even though there was no sacrifice around, he willingly put himself on the altar, would have died in obedience to God's will. But what happened? God ended up sending a ram to take his place. But here's the thing. When Isaac was on that altar, he died just the same. He was willingly yielding himself up to God's will. He said, I am going to be a living sacrifice. What was the second instance? It was Jesus. Jesus was the second living sacrifice sacrifice. We ultimately know what he did, came and lived a sinless life and then ultimately gave his life so we could be forgiven. There's a story about an aged pastor of a little Scottish church and he was asked to resign one Sunday morning because there had been no conversions in the church for over a year. Uh, the old preacher said, it has been a lean year, but there was one conversion. 
And one of the elders asked, one conversion, well, who was it? And the pastor said, well, it was a guy by the name of Little Bobby. They had forgotten all about Little Bobby, and, and Little Bobby had not only given his life to Jesus, but he said, I'm going to work fully for the Lord. And during one of the worship service, what ended up happening was the elder came by and had the offering plate, and Little Bobby asked the elder, he said, can you put the offering plate on the floor? And the elder looked at him kind of crazy, and Little Bobby stepped inside the offering plate. He said, I have nothing else to give but myself. This guy later became known as Robert Moffat, who became one of the, the biggest missionaries in Africa, helping win that, that continent to Jesus Christ. There was also a woman who asked her pastor, she said, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? The pastor took a blank piece of paper and handed it to her, and he said, sign the bottom of it and let God fill in the rest as he sees fit. That's what it looks like to be a living sacrifice for Jesus, saying, hey, God, I'm going to let you do whatever you want to do with my life, however you want to do it. See, when Paul, what he means when he, when he urges the brethren to pre present themselves as a living sacrifice, he's saying, God, you just have your way. Next, we offer ourselves to God at all times. Here's the thing. Living implies life. Life is something that we do every day, right? Life is something that we do every day. So here's the thing. Offering ourselves to God should not be contained in a 60-minute window. This is not the only time you should come in and say, God, I'm yours. Is when you enter into this house and when you leave out of this house, you act the way you want to act or you live the way you want to live. This should be something that we do at all times because here's the thing. A living sacrifice is a sacrifice that is continuous and alive. This means that our worship doesn't just occur in the sanctuary. It means that it occurs in every moment of our lives. Think about it. True worship is our personal linking of faith and works. It is offering your everyday life to God. It's, 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 it's going further than just the four walls of the church. Here's the thing. Real worship sees every moment as an opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus. And it sees every deed as a moment of, of, of worship. See, every person should have this attitude. I'm going to go to church to worship God. But it should extend further than that. It should, it should extend to the workplace. It should extend to school. It should extend to the ball field. It should extend to hobbies. It should especially extend to the home. See, worship affects everything that we do and every place that we go. Think about this. It's kind of crazy that a lot of people get in the mindset that we leave worship inside the four walls of the church. That's where it stays. Because I think a lot of people, when they go outside the four walls of the church, worship becomes almost like a foreign language. And you know, the bad thing about it is a lot of people don't see the discrepancy between it. Worship should occur every moment of life. A.W. Tozer said this about worship. If you will not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him on one day a week. Like I said before, worship it's not just a church activity. It's a life activity. It's something that we do every moment of our days. And finally, close with this. We offer ourselves to God through transformation and renewal. See, we demonstrate our commitment to Jesus by refusing to conform to this world. And, and, and we do this by being transformed by the renewing of our, our minds. Paul states in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. See, when we truly and totally give ourselves to God, it's reflected in how we live each and every day. It's, it's reflected in how we live each and every moment. See, even though we may not be of the world, uh, even though we may be in the world, let me rephrase that, we're not supposed to be of the world. But here, let me say this before I go any further. We're not better than anybody else. It's just that we have a God that says, hey, I want to use you to change the world. See, we don't look like the world or act like the world. Uh, we live basically nonconformist life. And what that means is we don't conform to the things of this world, but we live transformed lives because of what Jesus has done for each and every worst, uh, one of us. Here's the thing. Worship people are changed people. And it's reflected in how we live everyday life. It's reflected in how we walk. It's reflected in how we talk, our actions, our personalities. When we give ourselves to God, it's no longer about us, but it's all about Jesus. We wor we're not worried no more about the things of this world, but we're worried about Jesus shaping our lives into what 
it, mean, it needs to be. See, the primary goal of worship is transformation. It's being transformed. I want to tell you a real life story for just a second. We're going to close with this. It happened the other day. And the reason I know it was real life is because it happened to me. My stepbrother is not a person that you would think would be a, would, would be a churchgoer. My, my stepbrother has been in and out of prison more than he's been not since he's been 18 years old. And he is a, your prototypical biker. He has got the long beard. He's got the long hair. He's got the tattoos. He wears the leather. He does all of this type of stuff. Uh, and he's just not somebody that you would think would be just like a regular church goer. And we, uh, I'm doing his wedding this next Saturday, and, and I'm tickled about it because anytime I get to do a wedding, I get to share the gospel. And so I'm doing his wedding next Saturday out at Delo Water Park, and, uh, and uh, we go out to look and see uh, the place where we're going to have the wedding, and we're going to go to Jose's afterwards. And so we go to Jose's, and he's on his motorcycle, and, and, uh, and I've got it in my mind before we get there, I'm going to watch people. I'm going to watch folks. And as we walk in, the stairs just started. People were just looking. And you could just tell as he walked by, people would just follow him by. And I'm thinking to myself, man, people are judging him based upon what he looks like. And I'm thinking to myself, and this may, I may be talking to the choir here, but I'm thinking to myself, how many of those folks are sitting in church on Sunday morning? And they're thinking that. They're thinking, you know, I, I, he better not come around me or he better not you know, do this or do this. And my stepbrother's asked me before, he's like, do you think I could come to Corinth Baptist Church? I'm like, yes, sir, you could come and you could sit right next to me. But I don't know if Corinth's ready for him. And you may shake your head and you may say, well, oh, yeah, we're ready. But if somebody like that were to walk through those doors, what would be the reaction? What would be the mindset? What would be the heart set? Would we welcome them folks in here? Because see, if we're going to give this all-in mentality of following Jesus, then it can't just be I'm going all-in to, to come to church from 9 to 11. It has to be I'm going to love Jesus with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I am going to love people no matter. It broke my heart, man. When people were looking at my stepbrother like that. He's rough around the edges, I know. But he would give his shirt off his back for anybody. And I'm thinking to myself, is our church there? Because the way we're going to grow physically and spiritually is if we do what's commanded in this book. And that's loving people. I heard a pastor ask one time, he was asked by another pastor, he said, why is your church growing so well? Why, what are y'all doing? What programs are y'all using? And he said, brother, he said, we just love Jesus and we love people. That's what it's about. That's what we're in need of. That's what this world is in need of. This world is not in need of a government that's going to come in and take our problems away. This world is not in need of a, a, another program. This world is in need of a church that is totally and completely sold out to Jesus. That we're willing to say, Jesus, I come to you presenting my body as a living sacrifice. That way you can use it in whatever way you see fit. That way this world can be changed. And don't sit here and tell me it can't be done. Because he took 12 uneducated disciples and Acts, the book of Acts said he turned the world upside down. Could you imagine if the church... And I'm not talking about buildings. I'm talking about if the church truly got on fire for Jesus. Could you imagine what happened if we had this mindset of, man, I'm going to present my life as a living sacrifice. Do you, you, you imagine the people that would be changed? Imagine the people that would be saved? You imagine the, 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 the families that would be restored? You could imagine all this stuff would happen if we said, Jesus, I just want you to do something in me. And that's the thing. I want it to be done to me. I, I don't... I don't know if I want to go back to the old normal. Maybe it needs to be a new normal. Maybe it needs, we need to hit the altar every Sunday praying, not just for our church, but the lost. When's the last time you hit your knees over the lost? 
When's the last time you've been burdened for the lost? What, what was Jesus' main thought process in Scripture? He said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. That ought to be on the forefront of our minds as a church each and every day that we came to seek and to save that which is lost. What's the mindset of Corinth Baptist Church? What's the heart set? Why do we exist? Is it just to come to church every Sunday? Or is it to truly lift up Jesus and pray that this place fill up to the point where we've got to build bigger buildings or that we send people out to start other buildings? What's wrong with us having that mindset? What's wrong with us having saying, hey, we're going to send, we're going to go plant churches. That's, and forgive me if I start going off on a little rant. I'm sorry. What's wrong with us sending people out? What's wrong with us growing to the point to where people are so on fire that we want to send people out to start churches where there ain't no churches? Where people don't know Jesus? What's wrong with that? It's like we've gotten to the point to where if we go down front, people are going to think we're, we've got problems. No, let's just let's pray. Let's just see God do something amazing. Let's see God change, not just the way we, the way we work and the way we live but the way, and the way we worship, but let's see God do something extraordinary that can only be explained by God doing it. And that he does something incredible and that lives are changed and that, and that families are changed. And we just, it starts with us. You know, the thing about this, there's no backup plan. God wants to use the church to change the world. And I say, let him do it. So this morning, wherever you're at, if you don't know Jesus, my prayer is that you don't leave this place without coming to know Jesus. Find somebody. Find me. Find an adult. Find somebody that you know that loves Jesus and say, hey, can you just tell me about Jesus? Because I'm pretty sure in a crowd this size there's somebody that don't know Jesus. Don't leave without coming to know Jesus Christ or at least asking somebody. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're not where you need to be because trust me, the thing I said at first, there's people that's got problems. If you're breathing, you got problems. If you're breathing, you're struggling. If you're not where you need to be, come to the front. Come pray. There is nothing wrong with coming to this front and saying, God, I need you. But here's the thing. Also, thing about God, he'll meet you where you're at. If you want to do it out there, do it out there. Pray out there. God, do something in me. Bring me back to you. Lead me back to you. And then finally, here's the thing. And this is probably one of the most important. If you're sitting here today and you know Jesus and you feel like you're where you need to be, hit your knees and pray for the church. Hit your knees and pray for the pastor search committee. Hit your knees and pray for the individuals that make up this church. Hit your knees and pray for the lost. That's what we need to be doing. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your life that you came and you gave so we could have life. Thank you so much, Father God, that you want to use us, that you want to empower us through your Holy Spirit to, to take your gospel message out into the world, Father God. Man, I, I, I pray for change. I, don't, I, I pray for a new normal. I pray for something that looks totally different than what we've been doing, Father God. Something that, that just where we, we, we desire you and, and we crave you, Father God, and that we ultimately point people to you, Father God. And so if anything needs to be done today, Father God, my prayer is that you do it. Holy Spirit, through your power, that you move. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you join us as we sing number 413? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. All who will, please stand. Mm -hmm. 